Hey, welcome to the Cottony Lab. Um, thank you for your interest in our Human Craniofacial Epidemic Atlas. And so you can locate our website here, cottony.research.ucsc.edu. And if you're interested in our data, you can simply go to the Data tab, click here. What you'll see on this page are a number of links directly to our data uh, that will load them in the UCSC Genome Browser. And we've, we've set up a number of different shortcuts to a variety of genes that um, are interesting to the craniofacial community, and we'll be happy to add shortcuts to any other genes as the community requests them. And so we can now um, view our data directly and use the C Genome Browser with a single click, so you don't have to spend a whole lot of time trying to load up the data on your own. We've done a lot of that hard work for you uh, to make this as easy as possible for a variety of users to use. So I'm going to just pick a gene out of the hat here so we can go to PAC7. <coughs> Once this loads into the UCSC Genome Browser, We'll see a number of different things that are actually um, loaded automatically. And so at the top here are our super enhancer calls. So we think these are clusters of enhancers that are most strongly active in a given tissue and they're likely to identify lineage specification genes. And then you'll see a number of multicolored tracks here. And these are the chromin state segmentations annotated by Chrome HMM using the same uh, conventions as Roadmap Epigenome. And these are going to be the most useful for the variety of um, largest number of users that are going to want this data. So you'll see here these oranges and yellows typically are enhancers. Um, reds in here are um, active promoters and active TSSs. Uh, and then there are a variety of other colors, particularly this purple uh, identifying bivalent states that would likely be interesting to um, craniofacial researchers. And so we're looking at here currently, we've got loaded around a 700 KB window of the human genome on the HG19 build. And then you'll see signal tracks for all the different ChIP-seq data sets that we have generated. So you, you know, if you're interested in a particular signal, you can zoom in on those. Um, or if you're interested in a particular gene, you can locate that. So here's PAC7. You can see the annotation down here. And now below it, you can see all of these um, annotations for conservation as calculated by file OP across the 100 vertebrates, the multi-Z alignments, um, and so you can zoom in on something that's conserved across a variety of species or something that you're interested in based on other reasons. So in this particular area, we've got a number of different potential regulatory elements located out here upstream of, uh, of PAC7. Uh, this looks like it's maybe the promoter of this, this particular gene, so I'll try to find something in here that might be useful to a variety of users. So maybe downstream actually of PAC7 so we can hold shift and click and drag within this browser window and now we can zoom in anywhere we want. So we'll click zoom in. And now you can see an up close sort of 65 KB window now of something that's been annotated in the human genome. And so we've got a couple of very strong enhancers here um, that look like they might be very interesting. Um, you can see that they are conserved all the way down to zebrafish. So if you're in the zebrafish community and you want to try to identify a regulatory element that may also be active in zebrafish, that's a good way to do it. So we can zoom in here and find something that's a little bit more manageable to uh, look at. <coughs> so now we've got these enhancer states here. Again, we can scroll further down and we can see some very strongly conserved non-coding regions that go all the way down to zebrafish. So we'll go further in here into what may be a single craniofacial enhancer. So now we've got a 1 KB piece of DNA, and if we want to retrieve that DNA uh, from the human genome, we can go up here to the top under View. I'm just going to open this link in a new tab, and we can actually see the DNA. We can either pad it out to get something larger, we can change the positions, uh, and then retrieve that DNA. So now you have the human genome sequence at that location, so you could design primers for uh, screening or cloning into a reporter construct to test this as enhancer activity. So I'm going to close those tabs. Now if you wanted to actually identify uh, where in the genome this comes from in another species, this is also fairly straightforward to do with the UCSC genome browser. Uh, so you can see that there's a little chunk of DNA here that seems to be conserved all the way down to zebrafish. We can now go to view in other genomes, and I'm going to also open this in a new tab. We go here, and now you can see that we're currently loaded in the human HG19 version, 
and then we can over here pick the uh, new genome we want to view said DNA in. And so I'm going to change this to the zebrafish genome. And now you can pick the, the version of the genome that you're uh, most accustomed to, and I'm just going to go to um, ZV9 or Dano Rario version 7, change to that, and click Submit. And you'll sometimes get a list of a number of locations uh, in the genome where this piece of DNA might have come from, and in this case we've got a single location. So we can click here. And now we have what is a human craniofacial enhancer that is conserved in zebrafish. And so there's only about 141 base pair module, but then we can zoom out um, and see that this is now indeed conserved near what is thought to be either the PAX3 or PAX7 homolog in zebrafish, and you can start to decipher what, what you want to actually go in and study. So here's 14 KB now that we've zoomed out, and you can see these, this block of uh, repeated conservation of non-coding DNA. So I'm just going to go back now. So this would be a, a very interesting element to uh, target for um, functionalization in zebrafish. And so again, you can use the same tools, uh, get the DNA, get DNA, and now you're off to the races in another species. Now, so that's one way to get to our data. The other way is to load it directly from the UCSC Genome Browser itself. So I'm going to go back up here and go to ucsc.edu uh, for the Genome Browser. And just for um, consistency's sake, I'm going to reset this browser uh, so you see exactly how this would start up. So we get to the Genome Browser. And then what we can do is actually go to um, Track Hubs. And there's plenty of tutorial videos on using the UCSC Genome Browser, and I'll post links to those to the YouTube channel for the UCSC Genome Browser. Uh, but if you scroll all the way to the bottom here now, you'll see the Cotney Lab uh, Track Hub. Click Connect. And now you have access to the same data. So I add a little timeout, and now we can go to the, the, the main page. So if you're interested in a particular gene, um, again, I'm just going to pull one out of the hat here. I'm going to say BMP4. Click here and then click go. <clears throat> and so this will load up just that gene annotation. And so you can see all of those tracks. Uh, down below here, you can see various other tracks that we have loaded that you can turn on or off within uh, the UCSC Genome Browser. I'm just going to zoom out here a little bit. We tend to look at this at a, at a, at a larger scale. This is a little bit simpler view than what you get if you come directly from our website, but basically it's the same underlying data. So you can see this very strongly bivalent region for BMP4 and a whole host of regulatory elements surrounding it. And so we've got a 500, mega, 500 kilobase window surrounding BMP4. And we've got a number of enhancers that look like they're very strongly active out here. So we can zoom into these regions. And you can see a, a whole battery of conserved regulatory elements that look like they're active in our craniofacial tissue. And the great thing about the UCSC Genome Browser is there's a lot of other data that you can plug into, and so you can go back to track hubs and you can turn on things like the roadmap epigenome data. Um, we tend to use this particular track hub here. Click connect. We can go back to that location. And now we can load up all of that data. So I'll just show you quickly here. Go click on Chrome HMM tracks. And then we can load the exact same types of annotations that we have calculated. Uh, and we're using this imputed HMM model. So if you click here, we can turn them all on at once. And then click Submit. And now this will send us back to the UCC Genome Browser in the window that we previously had open. And now we've loaded all of the roadmap epigenome chrome state segmentations along with our previously loaded data in one session. So you'll see down here uh, a nice set of annotations. And let's go see if we can maybe find something that is craniofacial specific. So I know there are some near MSX2. So we'll go here. And again, you can type a gene name anywhere in this box up here, and you can usually locate the gene uh, pretty rapidly. So I'm going to zoom on out. I'm 
All right, so now we're at a 600 uh, base pair, 600 kilobase window surrounding MSX2, and you can see a whole bunch of uh, data from Robat Bipa Genome, same types of colors. And if you zoom in here now, you'll see something that we think is pretty interesting. So this is a region that looks like it's uh, pretty strongly active only in human craniofacial tissue. There's uh, this sort of funky repressed state here, but the only place that we see that this nice bright yellow color consistently is in our human craniofacial tissues. And so you can see a whole bunch of elements down here that might be uh, driving that um, activity in craniofacial development. So you can go in and, and try to amplify these just like I showed earlier, pulling out the, the appropriate piece of DNA, uh, and then you can do whatever you want with it. So again, you can type any gene up here. You can go to that gene, so that, let's go to the DLX5 and 6 locus, and this will be the last one I'll demonstrate. <coughs> So again, you'll see the strong bivalent state in many different tissue types, along with this very strongly active uh, transcriptional activity uh, in the craniofacial tissues for the DLX5 and 6. So I'm going to zoom on out here again. Uh, I'll talk about the half megabase scale. And now you can see uh, a number of regions here that are active in other tissues and not our craniofacial samples, um, and then enhancers that are active in our tissues and, and, and vice versa. So I hope I've uh, given you a, a sampling of how to use our data. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, if you want additional shortcuts to your gene of interest, we'll be happy to add those as well. And we hope the whole community can use this as a, as a resource for understanding uh, craniofacial abnormalities and normal craniofacial development.